this. Right, they usually exactly. end up in the mob. So no, they they do usually end up in the mob. <laughs> so. You know who never ends up in the mob? Who? Hey, everybody! Welcome back to Pixlet. I hope I hope we never end up in the mob. Hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Kevin. Alongside with me is Phil. Hello. And uh, today we're starting a brand new book. Oh, new book, new genre. New genre. Yeah, we've been on sci-fi and military sci-fi uh, for quite a bit now. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, hard sci-fi, soft sci-fi, flaccid sci-fi, mm. you know. It's, <laughs> it's just a little cold outside sci-fi. <laughs> Grower sci-fi, shower sci-fi. <laughs> exactly. Uh, We've been we've been in there for a while, yeah. um, uh, and now we are in good old fashioned sword and sorcery land. Look at this: we got Diablo Legacy of Blood, which is the first of the Diablo novelizations. Mm -hmm. And this um, is another. We're just we just love uh, uh, opening up Pandora's box here. We are we have opened up like se excuse me several franchises. Yeah, that are books and books long. Yeah. And this is another one. So <laughs> this is another one. This is going to be this is going to be a a beefy series. I mean, we'll probably um we'll see how far we get into the Diablo franchise. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? And it's you know what this is a, this is a nice looking book. I, I, you got the really nice uh Yeah, it's it's edition. the new it's like a new printing of it or something oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, that's and cute. It's, it's it's it feels good. It feels you good know, in the hands. Embossed cover and embossed mm, cover. I got my it, my beat up two dollar. Oh, it is beaten the beat the shit out of that a, one. With a with a, a like parking receipt lice uh, no, lice, uh page holder. Like it's just it's a mess. But that's this this is pure pulp, and therefore, I'm gonna beat the shit out of this Just book. Beat the absolute shit out of it. Yep. Um. So this book is uh written by Richard A. and I'm I'm not sure if it's Knack or Knack. I'm assuming uh, Knack. Uh. But yeah, I guess it could be Knack. Yeah. Um. Richard. Uh. He, so he wrote uh, Legacy of Blood. And I don't know much else because I did not research about the author. Oh, here we go. He's a New York Times bestselling author and USA Today. Uh, written for such well-known series as World of Warcraft, Diablo, Dragonlance, Conan. Oh, hell yeah. Which, that's that's right up your alley. That's my uh, jam. And Pathfinder. And Pathfinder. is the creator... Yeah, I, oh. I guess Pathfinder has some... Yeah, I mean, Dungeons & Dragons has books, so why, yeah. why oh, not yeah, Pathfinder? Yeah. Makes sense. Um, and his creative popular epic fantasy saga, The Dragon Realm. He's also written comic, manga, and gaming material, and his works have been translated worldwide. So he's kind Richard, of another one of our, you know, uh, Deets and Island style kind of writers for hire sort he's of a, He's a journeyman, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think my favorite thing is on the back of my edition of it, uh, the way it describes it is an original tale of sword, sorcery, and timeless struggle based on the best-selling, award-winning, M-rated electronic game from Blizzard Entertainment. I love I love, I love that, that they threw in M-rated. M-rated. That's my favorite part. They're like, this isn't just regular fantasy. This is fantasy that fucks. It's like, not... <laughs> this, this isn't your grandpa's fantasy. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is based on M-rated fantasy. Well, it's funny is it doesn't say that on my version. No, nope. it just says it just says uh, original tale, yada yada yada. Cuts out the M rated part, and then it has a sentence at the end that says intended for mature readers. Nice, yeah, mine's, so it, mine's it, got that too. <laughs> it's oh okay, they, but they had to, so they but they took out the M rated aspect because it's 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 kind of lame. It is pretty lame. <laughs> it's pretty lame. It's you guys lame. like Mortal Kombat? Hey, this is pretty, you guys, this is pretty rough stuff. You guys like Mortal Kombat with the blood code entered? I don't this know, man. This is like that. I don't know if you guys have played Streets of Rage, but it's pretty rough. <laughs> Those guys. <laughs> you, you ever play bad dudes? Those are some bad dudes. Those are some bad dudes. Are you pretty a bad, bad enough dudes. dude to re rescue President Ronnie? <laughs> Spoiler well, alert, you shouldn't because he's a terrible president. You shouldn't. <laughs> you should not rescue President Ronnie. Ronnie. The Contras. Uh, <laughs> That's why they called them the bad dudes, because they rescued yeah. him. 
And it set in motion so many horrible things. We're- yeah, I mean, trickle down economics, yeah. uh, Iran Contra, all that stuff, all yeah. could have been a- a- avoided if the bad dudes had not rescued bad President dudes had Ronnie. Just taken a taken a break that day and been like, nah, taking a break. Oh gosh. Lord. Anyway, Diablo. Diablo, <laughs> legacy of blood. Let's get into it. This is this let's, is a big. Let's one. get into it. So, uh, chapter one, we get introduced. <laughs> to uh three adventurers yes um they are norik uh Sadun, and faustin and uh norik and Sadun are warriors they're fighters and faustin is a spoopy wizard man yep <laughs> i kind of i kind of took Sadun as like a thief like it looks like the um because i think when, when the, you're, we're, we're introduced to a trio and it's yeah. the same classes that you could pick from the first Diablo game. Right. So I was like kind of nervous. It's <laughs> like, oh God, are we just following? How do they, how are we following Diablo? I don't know how you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, um, then, and then they got a gem and then put it into their sword and the sword was better then. And then they found another sword and they checked <laughs> the stats. And then they and decided then they to go with the new sword because it was better stats, even with the upgrade on the first slightly sword. better stats. And, it, and then and they killed a skeleton and loot just exploded just everywhere. A, just white trash, as far as the eye can see. <laughs> and it's that for 500 pages, 500 pages later. Uh, no, thankfully, it's not that. No, um, it actually uh, uh, one of the things that I've noticed about Richard Dax writing so far is he's very good at the. Um, oh, oh. The lights. Oh no. oh no! I don't know. For for those of us playing the uh, podcast game at home, Kevin's light just went on and then off. <laughs> uh, it, hold on, let me turn it off. I think we're never going to see him again. <laughs> All right. So for those of you at home, I have a a light in the center of the room hanging from the ceiling, and it's it's one of these. It's got one of these big big ass fancy bulbs that looks like an old timey bulb. So it has it looks like it has the giant filament inside like of it. The, uh, Edison bulbs. Yeah. Yeah. Except it's LED. Right. Ah. Uh, but it's we've only had it for like two years and it's already acting up. I just noticed it yesterday where I'll have it on and it'll be bright and then it'll just dim down for no reason. And then I'll forget <laughs> that it's on. And then like 30 minutes later, it'll go whoop and, and brighten back up again. It's like there's a poltergeist in it. It's like, yeah. So, Diablo. <laughs> so, I mean, that's actually perfectly appropriate because perfectly appropriate. yours is not the only place that is haunted. Yes. <laughs> so, we've got our party. We've got our party. You, yeah, we you. got our party. And yeah. uh, so, as I was saying, the thing that Richard Knack seems to be really good at so far is, like, describing environments and, and so, like, the giving a kind of like the the flavor text of, he of sets the, the area scene real well, he sets yeah. scenes very well um open like i said uh, i was talking to phil uh, a couple weeks ago i was like you know the opening sentence has a skull right in it and that's right perfect for diablo <laughs> it's just metal as fuck right off the bat yeah it's it's pretty great so you know you sat down with your friends said let's play a weekend game of D. There's only three of you, but who cares? Who wants to be what? And uh, we got our full party. Uh, we got a ranger, mm-hmm. uh, a fighter, and a sorcerer. And they you know? made and they made the rookie mistake: uh, no healer, no healer, uh, and, no and healer. Gonna, all offense, no defense. No, and that's going to come into play <laughs> later Real on. Quick. So they're investigating this uh, tomb, and it talks about how they're seven levels down, which yep. I feel like has to be like a nod to the to the actual game. Totally. Talking about it, it, it being laid out in levels. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally, totally. You know, you just they just they made their way down seven levels, and I, but I think the funniest part to me about that is because you think seven levels, you're like, oh god, what have you been playing the game for about you know half an hour at this point. But right. they make a point of saying, and they saw basically nothing the whole yes. way down. There's just been nothing. They have seen uh, traps that had already previously been tripped yep. and no bodies. So like, so like the spikes are already out of the wall. Like there's nothing for them to avoid. The traps are already have already been launched. Yep. Um, 
One of the mo- the interesting things, though, is they're because they're like talking back and forth and they're thinking about, you know, the their adventures so far. And uh, they talk about um, this better be not better not be like what they just ran into in Tristram, Tristram which is yeah. where Diablo takes place. And there was like two weeks earlier. They were just in Tristram and then like they were like, oh, yeah, no, Diablo's to Diablo's tomb has already been hit. This guy went da- all the way down, killed Diablo. And since then, everybody's taken everything. And it, so right. basically, I think it's hilarious that our traveling party is a, is these three guys who are just like a couple weeks too late. Right. In, in, for the for the Diablo, <laughs> Diablo they, they one story. They basically <laughs> came in after you, the player cleared out the dungeon <laughs> like like the townspeople talk about this guy the wanderer you know yeah. and, and who who basically went down the rumors he killed diablo took all the loot there's nothing left and that's what they've already dealt with so they're worried that this is going to that they're this basically the same following thing. more of yeah. your hijinks <laughs> that is an absolute wink to the audience it's i think it's a really great way to open the book you know? it is a good way it's, it's like, like this it's like is not in this no way not, copying the game. Yeah, this is not Diablo 1. Diablo no. 1 clearly happened two weeks prior. Right, right. <laughs> like, we're setting, like, a, a timeline. Two weeks ago, Diablo 1 happens, mm-hmm. and it's not related to that. <laughs> yeah, and that, that character you played that you had so much fun investing in, he's done. He's moved on. You're, he's he's not, moved on. You're he's the wanderer. Book. He's continued wandering. Right, right. He, he kept going. So, uh, yeah, we've got uh, Norik the fighter, who's basically, like, a retired veteran at this yeah. point um he's and uh Seydun, uh who yeah thief ranger soldier kind of guy um who suggests basically is like look if the, the 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 nearby militia is hiring mercenaries maybe <laughs> yeah. we could go join up with let's them. go join the army or something i don't yeah. know man i need and, something to eat <laughs> right and nork has no interest in that because he that's why he's a uh dirtbag uh you know murder hobo these days because he yep. hated the army uh, so they keep going and they're approaching the central chamber, you know, and that's where we should be able to find if there's anything in here, there's going to be something in this. There's going to be chamber. loot. There's going to be some loot in this some chamber. Some loot. There's got to be something. Maybe. Uh, yeah. So yeah, they, they get in there, uh, they're, they're getting it and things are starting to get a little spoopy. Um, uh, the, the, the wizard who is also referred to as a Vigeri, um, which, I don't know enough about Diablo to know if that means anything, but he's he's a he's a he's a particular type of person. Um, <laughs> I think and, it's the general like order of the sorcerers. Like, sure. I, I think I don't I don't think it's because we do get another order later on. Uh, yes. Another the, one of, of the sorcerers. other main characters, ostensibly right. is, is a different order. Um so yeah, uh, Faustin, the sorcerer, is basically he has he's been lighting the way this entire time with his staff. You know, he has uh, he has one of those D and D spells that lights yeah. shit up. Whatever, it's yeah. magic. <laughs> they go ahead and they light some torches. You know, because it's for some reason it's like in the central chamber. It's especially dark, so his glowy yeah. staff is not do- not doing the trick. They right. light up some torches, and wouldn't you know it? Uh, they find things. It's a lot of dead bodies. It oh, is. A ton. It is. It is just so many dead bodies. It is. It is a remarkable amount of dead bodies. Think yeah. of the the ship scene in Goonies, yeah, where they find One Eyed Willie and yeah. and multiply it by a factor of like five. It, just imagine that that like <laughs> that that Corey Feldman would be tripping every like thirty seconds over right. over a over some bones yeah you know it's just just different yeah and some of them are bones basically down to dust and some of them are uh you know just kind of shrunken court like they they various states of decomposition various states of decomposition nobody too recent uh but yeah but they don't know what killed them they just know that they're in a room full of dead bodies uh the walls are covered in gems and these magic runes and there are most importantly just piles upon piles of treasure piles like, of gold like a like a D D, you know uh uh cover you know yeah. just just the, just jewels and gold and everything it's, like that. it's the it's the dragon's horde without the dragon exactly exactly <laughs> as far as they can tell 
nothing to be worried about except the impending doom that comes from being in a room full of corpses. <laughs> Yeah, so corpses uh, in the Diablo universe tend to resurrect, don't they? They do that. They do that a lot. <laughs> uh, they're they're big on that, especially when on... you deal with necromancers. But uh, yeah, this yeah. is some necromancy takes effect, and wouldn't you know it, the corpses uh, corpses come alive. Right. Who could right. Who could have seen that happening? Who who would have, who would have thunk it? You know, it's it's uh, yeah. They they uh, they. See, yeah, they're surrounded by these things beforehand. They, they, they end at the end of, at the end of the room is this dais uh, that has this the remains of this body in this specific red armor. Yeah, it's red suit of armor. Yeah, and uh, the wizard investigates and 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 sees that the body doesn't have a head and there's yeah. no sign of the head anywhere, and it, it kind of tells him uh, where they are. And uh, let me see. It gives him it gives him an idea where they are. He says, by heaven, no, do you not see one gloved finger pointed at the red breastplate? This is the lost tomb of Bartuk, Lord of Demons, Master of Darkest Sorcery, the Warlord of Blood. The words escaped Norik as little more than a gasp. He knew very well the tales of Bartuk, who had been who had risen among the ranks of sorcerers, only to later turn to darkness, to the demons. Now the redness of the armor made perfect and horrible sense. It was the color of human blood. So the smarter two members of the party immediately go, we're getting the fuck out of here. Right. <laughs> you know, they're going to, and this is, and this is why, because at no point, because you're right. At no point did they say that Saidun uh, is like a thief per se right. or a rogue, but he fills all the tropes when they go, Saidun, we got to get out of here. And he's, Filling like he's basically like a cartoon character, filling his pockets with gold and yeah. putting rings on every finger. And uh, he's and he's just going, no, come on, guys. Absolutely not. He's We've the guy from so for this. He's the guy from uh, what's it? Um, uh, the mummy. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just he's just he's 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 he can't see the forest, you know, for the corpses. And uh, yeah, the forest from the corpses. The skeletons from the the half eaten remains, right? Uh, and Norik and and uh, and and Faustian are are basically like, you know, they they at least I think I think the wizard is like he deals in sorcery enough to know a cursed room when he sees one. Yeah, and Norik is superstitious enough to go absolutely not. No, thank right. you. Faustin Faustin casts uh, detect magic, and he's like, oh boy, this is not good. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and the legend with Bartuk basically is they said he was a terrible, horrible warlord who used demons to destroy everything in his path. Mm. Um, he ended up being defeated by his brother and his body was entombed in this very tomb to seal away his evil. Yeah. Uh, and a whole uh, lot of evil. Yeah. Yeah. And many of his kids, uh, 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 like a, a lot of his followers had kids. And uh, those people still are around today and uh, mm. basically kind of in, imply that Norik was probably, you know, fighting alongside of them when he was in the army. Right. Uh, and so they pull a Marines. We are leaving. Yeah. Uh, but not in uh, not in a good enough time. Not, not a good in enough, enough time, time because guess what? The Skelly men are awake now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a classic, it's a classic movie scene. You got the guy basically stuffing a burlap sack with a dollar bill on it, full of gold, just gibbering about just the money. Scrooge McDuck in it. Absolutely. And as he's doing this, <laughs> there's just this shambling horde of zombies coming up behind him and his friends are pulling the Bugs Bunny like. Yeah. Point yeah. Point. Yeah. Yeah. And, no, it's, uh, yeah. it's not a good, it's not a good moment. Uh, so they have to fight. They're fighting. They're going nuts. It's, they, yeah, it they is start tooth and nail. And, and Norik is being forced, pushed back and back. He's separated, basically. For, he gets up south, separated from Sadun and Faustin. And he's being pushed back and back towards the dais. Dais? 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 Dais. 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 Yeah. Dais. Um, he gets get pushed back towards the pedestal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and he's fighting. He loses his sword to the horde, and he's like just trying to do anything he can. And he puts his hand back, and he accidentally touches the armor. Yes. And uh, when he pulls his hand back from the armor, uh, he is now somehow wearing 
the gauntlet of yeah. the the of Bardock's armor. Yeah. And um things spin wildly out of control from Absolutely. there. Absolutely. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> like he starts talking words against his will. Uh just like just he starts speaking these horrible magic words that no one really understands. Maybe the wizard understands, probably. Yeah. But he doesn't. He's, he's he's no idea. He's an old grunt. He doesn't know what it, it's like. It's like if your buddy who was in a fraternity for six years of undergraduate uh, suddenly started spouting Latin uh, <laughs> at you and, you and and Latin that had nothing, you know, and not Greek for once. Right. Uh, you know, it just uh, I just realized what it did there. And, uh, <laughs> and that would that would freak you out. Right. right. And, it, and indeed, it freaks out everybody in the room. Uh, but the one good thing is that the magic words that he uses somehow consumes uh, the undead and drops them. Uh, yeah. And it leaves the, the, the party of three basically untouched. Untouched. You know what? They're, they are touched. They are totally safe. 100% safe. Things are A-OK. Except, um, except Nork starts to have some Bilbo Baggin thoughts. Yeah, he definitely is... <laughs> is uh, um he's it's definitely a a after all why couldn't i have the ring right. um, <laughs> That's exactly what like, why shouldn't i keep the gauntlet on <laughs> and the wizard it's it's terrific because the wizard knows what's going on and very carefully very diplomatically starts going maybe just, you should take the glove off take perhaps. the gauntlet off yeah. um so basically uh he he no <laughs> Norik grabs Faustin by the throat mm -hmm. and Faustin is trying to tell Sadon, cut his arm off. Like you have to cut his arm off. So right. Just it's not get coming it off. off. The, the, it, that glove you, isn't just sliding off. That glove, you got to cut his arm off to get the glove off of him. Um, and then we cut to black. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're left wondering what's hap what happened to Faustin and Sadon. Yeah. I don't know. Pretty, pretty good opening, if you ask me. <laughs> like... It's like, a pretty good opening. You get you get your you get your your metal as fuck D and D party in, yeah, and then one of them starts killing the other one with ancient cursed armor, and Cradle of Filth starts playing in the background. Opening credits, you know, there we are. Like, yeah, Legacy of Blood, boom. Legacy you know? of Blood. That's with that's perfect. Flame particle effects. Yeah, disposable teens starts playing. Yep, and. You know, <laughs> it's, and then it's, we get a wide sweeping shot of a desert. Yeah. Because we're in chapter two now. That's right. And we are meeting our uh I guess he's the villain for all intents and purposes. He's, I I'm trying hard. I can think I can only put my finger on one character that I'm definitely associating as a hero with a question mark. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's only one, one so them. far that's like there's only one so far, and we haven't even met her yet. Yeah. That is the hero, hero, um, heroic, heroic, and yeah. uh, of in the first five chapters, she has by far the fewest scenes. Oh, absolutely, she does. <laughs> fingers crossed, we'll see more of her. But for now, yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, uh, but we're not there yet because no. we are here in Aranach, um, Aranach, with the. Uh, the army of Mr. General Augustus, and I shit you not, this is his name, and he is the villain, Malevolin. <laughs> Malevolin! <laughs> Malevolin! I'm sure, Kevin, what shame else? on you. Shame on you for assuming that this, in our pulp sword and sorcery novel, that the General Warlord Malevolin is, is the villain. absolutely going to be the the, the 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 villain how dare you how dare i i, I, I thought you were of a, a, a broader mind than that i apologize <laughs> i i i should not have assumed that based on his name malevolin his general malevolin was uh he might be a stand-up guy he does he does sound like a he-man villain or something. he is a, he is basically a he-man villain he for all intents actually, and purposes yeah. he has a um so to to cut to the gist of it he's he's been massing this army and um he uh he has a sorceress that and this is the this part of the book is the 
is uh, the the she breasted boobily down the stairs. Yes, <laughs> yes. Bit. We get a real um, <laughs> Melisandra and Stannis Baratheon kind of uh, vibe here. Definitely, that's basically what it is. It's Melisandra yeah. and Stannis Baratheon, yeah. and she is she's the witch. Galliona. Galliona is, is the sorceress that works for Malevolent. And the way it's first set up, I was like, does he report? to Galeona because she has this massive tent and right we're like no he she it other way around and they um, when they talk about like how his soldiers his soldiers are all insanely loyal to him yeah uh like he's a good he's a good leader you know they trust him and they don't know why they're stuck out in this desert uh they've been marching and fighting for a while and now they've been in this desert for a while and the only thing that and they just kind of whisper among themselves because the witch has got a tent and he hops into the tent with her, and then sometimes she hops into his tent with him, and clearly some funny business going on there. Yeah, they're banging. They're banging. They're banging. Why wouldn't uh, they be? And, the desert and gets lonely. The desert gets lonely. In fact, um, there's a bit of dialogue. Uh, Galeona, my Galeona, slept you well. When I actually slept, my general. Ooh, ooh, oh, malevolent. Malevolent. Oh, boy. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah, um, so uh, what you find out, what we find out is that Malevolent is um, he's in search for the thing that we just saw in the first chapter. That's um, right. He has. So if you recall, the armor was without a head and yes. thusly without a helmet. Who has the helmet? Malevolent has the helmet. He wants yes. the rest of the armor. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, it's kind of uh, they get right into it. I will give it to them. They get right into it. You know, he's been having dreams of uh, Bartuk's armor. She's got the helmet. Clearly, everyone's this is we've got our MacGuffin and it's an evil, murderous MacGuffin. This it's time it's a it's a it's a armor. It's the armor of the murder hobo. Mm hmm. <laughs> Plus five. Yes. Plus five armor of the murder hobo. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is the ultimate murder hobo. It's a armor. legendary set of armor. Uh <laughs> it is quite literally plot armor at times. It is plot armor at this point. Yeah. And as we'll see. Um but yeah, so so uh Malevolent is like is he is quick to anger. Um yes. Because uh, he he gets like semi abusive to Galeona in this scene as well. Um, it is it's it's a it's a weird relationship. Um, yeah. And yeah. once he leaves, um, you start to find out what her her deal is. Um, yeah, because w when you get a character like this, it's really easy to, you know, what the fuck is her. Side what's she this? getting out of it what is she you know? getting out of this she's this, you know? she's this she's a she's this wicked hot sorceress who yeah. is just like why is she traveling around with this this hot-headed general right and she said you know she wants him to be bartuk's successor and yeah all that shit but why but why we're about to find out why we're about to find out um uh uh you know the 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 bug dude from um Space Ghost, Coast to Coast. Oh, yeah. Zorak? Zorak. Yeah. So this is his brother, Zazax. Right. <laughs> A <laughs> demon praying mantis. Is there any better kind, I ask you? <laughs> so hidden in the shadows of the tent it comes out Zazax, who is a demon praying mantis, who is uh, basically... Um, Galeona and Zazax have their own plans for yes. for Bartok's armor, and it's just like it's it, with all these magic people, it's plans upon plans upon plans. It's yeah. like like Malevolent doesn't know what Galeona actually wants, and then we'll find out Galeona doesn't necessarily know what Zazax actually wants. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so we 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 get a it's it's basically people betraying people betraying people. Uh, yeah. So Zazex confirms they've had this vision of the armor. It's been they they find out that they've realized that the armor has been taken by some schmuck, uh, some nobody in the middle some of nowhere, some absolute schmuck, absolute loser of a schmuck, absolute loser. He is such a dork, such a dork, such a stupid, stupid. 
And uh, and so they if it's probably named could, Doric or something. <laughs> something something Doric. Some, some sweaty Doric. name like <laughs> just some yeah, some sweaty old man. <laughs> he is a D I O N O S A. You are a dinosaur. Yeah. Uh and uh <laughs> I, I cursed are. us to that fucking earworm. <laughs> Why did I do that? If I'm doing what? this, you're coming down with me, Kevin. Why'd you do uh, that? And uh, so Zazek confirms that the armor of Bartuk, that that is indeed what's happening. It's authentic. And uh, Galeona is kind of like musing that she can manipulate the man in the armor. Ooh, the way she Ooh. always manipulates men with a with. strongly worded logical opinion. No, yep. no, with, with, with boobs that have surface tension that kind of that kind of body <laughs> apparently uh which we've already we've only gotten a hint at what happens to the dude inside of the arbor so i'm not thinking galeona um has a uh, much of a shot in hell here yeah no no but basically she's just she's just gonna try to get everybody in the same room together everyone the demon the warlord and the loser with the armor and whoever comes out on top, she'll just basically try to attach herself to. Exactly. That's yeah. that's all she she wants to do. Did you listen to the audiobook at all, by the way? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Did you hear the the voice for Zazax? I don't remember. It's so fun. Yeah. The, so like the guy is doing like regular voices, and then when the Zazax voice comes on, he starts going. This one knows that the armor is oh, that's, true. Yes, yes. This one knows that the it wanders this mortal plane. <laughs> He's clearly, I do remember that. He's like having so much fun with it. <laughs> Voice actors just chewing the scenery with just this guy. chewing the absolute scenery. I it's love it. It's <laughs> great. It's great. And the best part is, is when you read the book, uh, it's written to be that way. It's not like the guy had any other, he would sound stupid if he read those lines like a normal person, you've got to, you've got to put some, some stank on it and be a weird demon guy for it to actually work. And it's hilarious. It, yeah, it's really, this really one good. knows that the armor's true. Mm. Yeah. Yes, he does. He this does. one knows. Hmm. Yeah. He, it doesn't he work. could probably be a Werner Herzog. Accent. Now that is true. Now that I would actually, I would have strongly approved of that kind of turn. This one knows. I would, the, I would uh, like to the see the true. armor. This one knows that the armor is true. I am uh, praying mantis for some reason. It praying is, uh, mantis. I don't know uh, how much French for some. I don't know what the fuck yeah, I'm doing. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, I am a uh, praying mantis. And, uh, you uh, are uh, uh, some uh, loser who found the armor. Uh, je ne sais quoi, uh, loser. Loser. <laughs> 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 Zazax is puffing on a cigarette in this you, scene. You provincial peasant. <laughs> I do. I do remember once I I used to work with a with a, a handful of Romanians, uh, and uh, and we were all having a smoke break at one point, and uh, and I and I said to one we were talking about rednecks or something. Some they referred to some guy as a redneck, and I went, "Hey, what's the what's the Romanian version of that? What would you call like a redneck in Romania?" And one of them thought about it, and she went, um, a peasant, I guess. <laughs> and I went, oh, wow, that's way better. Yeah, <laughs> that's, 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 there it is. That's, wow, that's so much there's worse. A, there's a solid historical burn right there. Damn. Like, so uh, <laughs> that, that brings us to the end of chapter two. So chapter three, uh, we find out what happens to the rest of the part adventuring party. Oh, well, yeah. Let me tell you. It uh, it wasn't rainbows and sunshine. <laughs> it was not great. I, I I think this was actually hilarious because I thought the way they ended chapter one, like it's like he blacks out and all he hears is screaming. And so I'm like, <laughs> oh, everyone's dead now. Uh, and we're right. But it basically picks up right there from that end. And we actually see him killing we, uh, uh, not we, the wizard. We, he's already we, done that. We hear the memory of the, the, the words but we don't see it yet right away because mm. he wakes up in the middle of a field covered in blood. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. And then as the armor keeps walking, by the way, he can't stop walking. This is hilarious. This is so <laughs> funny. Yeah. Because based on the way the first chapter ended, I kind of thought that like 
he's now a demon like the armor's possessed him kind of kind but of not sort the of armor basically forces him to go and do the things that he want that it wants him to you ever and see weekend at bernie's marching. You ever see Weekend at Bernie's? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's week. It's a weekend. Weekend at Bernie's rules. I mean, Norik is alive and and Bernie is dead, but um, you know, same same concepts. Exactly, <laughs> and it just you get this impression because he doesn't want to keep marching, uh, yeah. but the armor forces him. So yeah, you do see this. You kind of imagine his upper body bending back while his legs are just kind of. <laughs> walking stepping along yeah, yeah. it's kind of hilarious especially when we get to a point where he just wants to take a nap and he cannot he cannot um yeah uh i have no nap and i must nap uh, right <laughs> um so yeah as he's walking along he starts to remember exactly what happened right that's and right. uh oh, my camera went out of focus get back on there camera what do you think follow the finger Follow the finger. Everything no. is haunted in your office today. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, the melodious sound of your voice will have to be enough. The melodious sound of my voice will carry you. Carry you through? Carry you episode. through the night. Um, <laughs> Norik remembers that he ripped out Faustin's throat. Yeah. Just ripped it right on out. You don't forget that, I hope. You don't forget that. And then he, um, how did he kill Soudan? Um, not, it wasn't pl pleasant. However, it was, it was, uh, it, it, it's, it's dead. He was dead though. By the end. He's dead. Very, oh, he kills dead. them both. Yeah. He kills them both. Then he, then he also wipe, puts the blood on the armor. He like, the yes, armor... he wipes the, he, it, it, there's a theme of that. He, the, the armor likes having blood wiped. It enjoys the it. blood. It yes. enjoys blood on it. Um, it is it is sort of like the uh those 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 uh Christ swords from Dune. Right. Uh, it needs it needs to soak up some blood before you put it away. Exactly. <laughs> so he's he's marching along, he's trying to remove his gloves. He can't do it. No. He tries the other pieces of armor he has on because he's like, okay, the gloves won't come off, but you know, but the are uh, the the boots and everything, they've got clasps on it. Maybe I can unclasp them. Uh, right. And the moment he does that, they just clasp right back together again. Yeah. Not happening. Yeah, not happening. He's and not. Basically, he's like, I've got to find a wizard who will uncurse. I, I'm wearing a cursed item. It's old RPG rules where you haven't identified the item. You equip it anyway. It's You're... cursed. Oh, and man, you have to find someone to uncurse it. Bad news when yep. you uh, when you when you uh, when you put on some cursed gear. Dude, always identify your items first. Always identify first. Um, so he starts like stumbling a little bit. Um, his well, his body starts stumbling. Oh yeah, um, because he doesn't want to be walking anyway, and he realizes that he's hungry. Like he hasn't eaten anything, so his body is basically just starting to fail. Right. Um, and there's one thing that the armor cannot abide is its boy Norik having a rumbly tummy. Yeah, so... it's, it's whiny human. It's Who whiny human. <laughs> so in the most absurd scene. I love this so much. It's so good. It's so it good. Is, it, is, it, is, it is so overly complicated yeah. in a way to feed somebody. Um, the armor summons, opens a rift in the ground and summons demons out of it. Yep. For the express purpose of cooking him a rabbit. <laughs> right. He literally he literally utters a magic word. The earth opens up. Half a dozen pig demons crawl out of the It's like a it's like a third graders idea of what hell is. It's yeah. like literal pig monsters pulling themselves out of the earth and they're not happy to be there. They, and then the armor like, uh, like makes what? him utter. Oh yeah. <laughs> armor makes him utter a word that terrifies them. They go off and run or they bring back uh, a dead goat, several rabbits, and a lizard. And he kind of said, all right, the rabbit, I guess. He's kind of disgusted by all this. And he goes to pick up one of the rabbits, and the armor burns his hand, and he doesn't know why until he pulls his hand back and sees that the rabbit has now been dressed and seasoned and perfectly cooked. cooked. Perfectly. Perfectly, perfectly cooked. Per the sous vide of medieval armor. He has just perfectly cooked this rabbit. 
and it and he kind of and he just and he eats it. This is the greatest armor of all time. And, greatest uh, armor of all time. Greatest armor of all time. And he eats the rabbit, gives the rest to the pig demons who kind of make him lose his appetite in the way that they eat it. Yeah. They crawl back into the earth, which closes up after them, and he moves on. Like continues that, walking. The, the armor moves. It's like we were talking about this before. It's like this armor does will do all kinds of shit. It's going to summon things out of nowhere. It's going to do all kinds. It is tr- literal plot armor. Yeah, uh, it will do whatever the story needs. It will do whatever the story needs. But for so, and and usually in a pretty effective, straightforward, straight line kind of way. But for whatever reason, whatever reason, it's like we're gonna summon some hunt some pig demons to hunt <laughs> some some food for you. And this and isn't then, the first time. The only time it's gonna happen. This is the only it's, time it's gonna happen. This, no, it isn't. Like it keep it well, happens. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's crazy. It, like, that's the one, I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> this detail. It's, it's an amazing detail. And I it's like, it. it's like something you want to fold into a D&D game. Oh my God. And, and, and <laughs> I'm going to. The moment we play a D&D game with someone who doesn't listen to the show. <laughs> it's gonna be, you're going to have like this really weird random encounter. <laughs> yeah. Pig demon sous chefs. And just like, oh, it's going to be amazing. It's like, you're okay, you're taking first watch. Can you roll a d20 for me? Yes, and then please. it's like a uh, 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 seven. And, and you're uh, like, all right, well, the, the earth trembles before you and <laughs> and uh, it opens up and these pig demons come out. Yeah, and um, one d4 plus two pig demons. One d4 uh, plus two pig demons come out. and um, and um uh, But they're wearing chef's hats. <laughs> right. <laughs> And one of them, you can't understand what they're saying, but one of them dis- displays a, uh, a diploma uh, from the uh, Cordon Bleu Institute. So- yeah, and uh, they 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 quickly and efficiently chop down some wood, build a little pop up shop for. Mm. <laughs> Start selling you kidney pies. You don't want to know where they came from, but there they are. <laughs> they yeah. had the kidneys want with them when they came out of hell. So <laughs> yeah. you know, come to your hell own kidneys. conclusions. <laughs> Probably. Probably the kidneys of some damned people is my guess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and so finally he's full of food. He feels better because he's not starving anymore. But now all he wants to do is sleep. And he literally cannot, the armor will not let him sit down. Nope. It will not, and, and which just mentally brings to mind the most ridiculous, like if you were adapting this to a movie, you could not include this scene. No. Without completely losing all credibility and seriousness. The armor is a dad driving his family on a cross country trip. <laughs> yeah. Just just no, no, no. Everyone like, stay can we away. stop and be like no. driving by a McDonald's. They're like, mm-hmm. uh, can we stop get McDonald's? And the dad pulls in, orders a black coffee, and, and- right. <laughs> Mr. Mullaney, this is what we're doing. <laughs> and it just and forces him to keep marching so norik is having a real normal he's not having a good time norik is is having a real bad time this is why live which is more than he can say for his buddies this is why we're not calling norik a hero um, right because he's not having puppet he's he's not he's just like oh poor buddy right what (laughs) what norik would or wouldn't do given his own free will we do not know we don't know he has not had free will for the majority of time that we've known him Yes. So we don't know if he's a good guy, bad guy. He's just a he's a he's a warm body. He's a warm point. body, and that's the all the armor really needs right now. Yeah. Uh, but now we meet um we meet ostensibly our protagonist, maybe. I don't know. Yes. We'll see. We'll see after as we get further into the book. I don't know yeah. yet though. So um, far, this one feels like the only one that we could call a hero question mark. Question mark? Yeah. Kara. Kara. Kara, uh, who is a necromancer. Yeah, she is. She's a follower of Rathma and yeah. a necromancer. And Which, uh, you don't get a lot of heroic necromancers. So no, I appreciate we don't. that. I it's do one of my pre- favorite wizard classes. Yeah, it's it's nice because you know what? It's more of just like like the necromancer. Just because they deal with death a lot doesn't mean that they're inherently bad. They just have a better right. understanding of death. And I think that's kind of how they pick, portray Kara as like, <laughs> excuse me, is like death is just part of the cycle of life. And she's yes. it's just where she draws her magic from she says she's a part of the death positivity movement that death positivity movement basically I, which i which i love so yeah, yeah keep, keep them going keep them going so she shows up at the uh the tomb 
of of uh Bardock and she's like, "Yeah, fuck." <laughs> right she immediately sees oh no so she's the the backstory on her is interesting because she is like one of the less least experienced members of whatever group she's a member of the followers right. of she's, Wrath kind of an apprentice. she's kind of an apprentice she's a low-ranking person and and but everybody else is busy so they're like hey <laughs> Everybody else is busy doing shit. They're like, can you go check on the tomb of Bardock? We feel, we have a we have a bad feeling something happened there. She's like, okay. And she goes down there, and yes, something bad happened there. The armor's missing. <laughs> right. The whole the one, yeah, that the whole thing, thing. The thing that we're trying to entomb and encapsulate here to avoid you know, the end of the world. Yeah. Cause it's her group's magic that set the trap, the the right. the trap of the resurrecting soldiers. So basically Every time somebody made it further into the tomb, it would add to the numbers right. of of uh, of undead that would it's attack. It's a pretty great trap when you it think is, about yeah. it. It makes its own gravy. It's fantastic. It does. But now yeah. they're all gone, and uh, there's like two fresh dead bodies down there. Yeah, and um, the armor's missing. <laughs> so <laughs> she basically she investigates the uh, uh, Faustin, the uh, the dead wizard's body. And does this ritual that essentially summons the ghost mm -hmm. of the wizard, uh, or kind of a placeholder, and she actually has to ask it very uh, uh, simple questions. Ouija board rules, right? Right. You know, <laughs> yes or no, that kind of thing. It was very. Uh, it made me think a lot. It was the very vampire, the masquerade, mm -hmm. necromancy kind of thing. Like very simple, the dead kind of deal, and it gives her a brief idea, basically of what went yeah. down and, and to do all this she uses this powerful magic ivory handled knife uh that's like this ritual dagger that like it cuts into stone at one point it's a pretty badass weapon yeah um and she but she hears a sound in the tomb and ends up following this crimson figure that she sees and kind of assumes it must be a ghost or something that she's gonna have to expel uh she leaves her knife behind and when she realizes that she's left it behind she turns around to go get it, and at that point she realizes that the knife, both of the corpses, and the crimson figure are all poof. They're gone. gone. Whoops. Basically, Whoops. Uh, imagine a cop leaving his losing his gun on his first day on the job. Oh god. That's basically what Kara just did. That is exactly yeah, <laughs> bad shit. That's oh my god, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> She's a she's a she's basically a a, a, a necromancy cop. Right. <laughs> I mean, kind of, yeah, kind yeah. Of. <laughs> she's a she's a necromancy mall cop, and it's the most dangerous mall in the world. So, and probably she was told King of Prussia or something. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's for the, that's for the Pennsylvanians. That's out for there. the Pennsylvanians. <laughs> the, also, the largest mall on the Eastern Seaboard. Yes, that's yes. so you know. So that's super dangerous. <laughs> that's uh, how chapter three ends. Chapter three ends with with uh, Kara losing her gun. And chapter four begins with um, kind of like a weird scene. And I have no idea what it means. Uh, there's is, just, just is, basically I, an old dude and there's a snake and a beetle. And yeah, like uh, we get we get this nature scene. We get this weird david attenborough kind of scene this is how i interpret it, it was, it's like it's this sand snake slithering through the desert sun trying to find shelter because the sun's only getting higher and 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 as it goes it gets devoured by this seven foot long beetle uh that sees an old withered man there and spits acidic venom at him uh it burns through the guy's shirt starts to damage him and he just kind of with a wave of his hand dissipates the the horrible venom and with a second wave of his hand essentially just destroys uh the giant bug he refers to it as a sand maggot yep. and then a hidden home in the dunes uh just kind of appears opens up to him like he's the diamond in the rough right right exactly if it had been <laughs> in the shape of a tiger with an open mouth i wouldn't have been surprised yeah and he just kind of mutters something vague about evil is coming and Walks I must into his definitely be careful, right? <laughs> While <laughs> I go into careful. my into my sand house, Pepperidge I love Farms, this man remembers. already. I 
I am invested in his survival and his dune house. I want a tour. And uh, so that's a real brief scene. Now we're back yeah. with Norik, uh, the walking man. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, the ultimate walking man. Poor the Norik. ultimate walking man. Um, Norik finds himself um, uh, finds himself at an inn. Yes. If you think this is going to end well, spoilers. It's not. <laughs> it's not. Nothing with his armor ends well. Yeah. But we do get, we get an inn and you see he, it's filled with a, a motley gathering just, of people. Just like, people. Uh, yeah. A hive of scum and villainy. Right. I was about to say it was like the Moss Eisley Cantina. <laughs> it's the Moss Eisley Cantina for all intents yeah, and purposes. It's crossed with your least favorite D&D group. You know, it's just... <laughs> The one that you played in middle school, you know, yep. it's just everyone's a power gamer. Everyone's a power gamer. They're all min maxed and it's all murder right. hobos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the innkeeper, he's starving and the and the innkeeper uh, tells him he can't have any food without any money. So the armor essentially conjures, conjures a gold coin. Just gold and like goes like, oh, is this behind you? You've got right. dirty <laughs> ears. Is this and, your car? Yeah. And uh yeah, and 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 basically the gold, it's because he's paying with gold and not like trade. Like normally in this kind of area you'd be right. like, hey, I've got some eggs. Can I, you know, right. or something. And I don't know why you'd trade food for more food. But the point is <laughs> it's it's a trade to barter system. Right. And right. uh the gold has gotten people's attention. It catches people. Oh, by the way, I enjoy that they that the, he uh, Richard Knack describes the innkeeper as having an extravagant belly. Oh yeah, <laughs> I made a note of that. I was like, that's what I'm calling this thing from now on. <laughs> this is an ex. This isn't. This isn't a beer gut. It's an extravagant belly. <laughs> My God, yeah, that's a that is that is good writing. <laughs> The Ursine Giant. <laughs> God, yeah. They, he has a way with words, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Just an Ursine Giant with an extravagant belly. And uh, uh, yeah, so the guy basically he pays with gold and he's like, okay, I need a room. So he gets a room. He gets he's a taking bowl his, of, his stew and he's taking stew, the stew up to his room. And he's like, I'm going to die, right? Like all of those guys saw the gold. They're going to fuck me up. It's like the armor is not very bright, basically. No. No, the armor is very single minded. It's like, look, we're just going to give these people what they want, what they what they want the most. Yeah, it seems to be what it is. And and uh, and and then we get to move on with our lives. So but finally, the armor does let Cornor get some sleep. Yeah. Uh, so he he has a dream of being uh, General Bartuk, essentially. He's, he's in charge of a bunch of horrible demons. and He's having this terrible dream of being a monster. Uh, and wakes to the sound of someone slowly, quietly making up their making their way upstairs. And and Norik's like, there's no there's no reason for anybody to be sneaking. Like right. the only reason for anyone to be sneaking, and I hear you doing your sneaky moves, is if they're trying to kill me. Right. <laughs> so three guys bust in the door trying to kill him. So, so Norik calls it. They try. Right. They, they come right in, try to kill him, and um. He, he he's thinking momentarily like maybe the armor is just going to let me die and it thinks one of these guys is better suited right. to be in the armor or something um but no the armor uh kills the shit out of these guys kills the shit out of these guys summons a sword from out of nowhere like a warlock like a war yeah <laughs> just and just kills everybody they end up rolling downstairs where the innkeeper and one of his buddies are waiting to basically berate these guys because they see the guys running out again. Yeah. And they're ready to be like, what the fuck? Where you, did you not get the guy's money? Right. The innkeeper's in on it. Yeah. And uh, and and but instead they find themselves being attacked by uh, a, a he, weird half sleepy. Yeah. He's guy in one guy from his throat all the way down to his waist. Oh yeah, there's um, some graphic fights. There's some graphic book. violence in this. Um, so it, so he goes downstairs and he faces off against the innkeeper who has the biggest sword he has ever seen. Yeah. Um, and the innkeeper is uh, had he been had he not been in the armor, he the innkeeper might have won because the innkeeper is actually kind of clever with his fighting. He knows how to surround somebody, and he's also massive. Uh, yeah, but yeah, he's clearly uh, been a fighter in the past. Norik has the armor of Bartuk, 
and uh uh yeah he he kills kills the other guy innkeeper takes off running yeah and then um the armor not satisfied uh takes the blood of one of the dudes draws a symbol and summons a demon and then tells the demon to go fetch the bartender <laughs> yeah it is it is pig rabbit dinner all over again <laughs> It's like, okay, I'm not, because armor, because there's the thing, the armor, I don't run. I don't run. I don't I chase. Don't nah, no, nah, I'm going to let someone else do that. It's, yeah, he, he, he yeah. delegates the chasing to it's, a demon. He's like, that's far, you know. Yeah, go get, no. Go get that no. guy. And um, he does. <laughs> I mean, he, 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 you, it, the death happens off screen as much as you can in a book. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you hear the right. It's like it's like no it says something like Norik hears the screams raise and pitch until they're suddenly cut off. <laughs> yeah. It's it yeah, so we know what happened, I we guess. Know, we know what happened. And uh so and uh, then uh, and then uh, the armor continues to play with the blood. I'm assuming it's just gonna rub more of that blood into just, itself. Just, just rubbing just, that just, blood mm, all over moisturize regimen, you know. I only oh, get boy. to do it when I kill people. So once or twice a day tops. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we cut to General Malevolent again. Our maybe hero, maybe a good guy. You never know. He could be a good guy. And maybe he's, he's a good guy. He's looking on the city of Loot Golane. Um, yes. Which yes. is like the richest city in the land um, because uh, and nobody's ever taken it. And right, he there's would like something to. that's always protected it. Yeah, it's like he thinks it might be magic is protecting it. I mean, it's also very hard to attack because of the. It's like a strip. It's a narrow stretch of land situated right. between two seas or something like that. So it's it's very defensible. But he also thinks there's some sort of magic, uh, yeah, magical luck that the the city has. Um, we get a little bit of uh, we get a little bit of backstory on him. He started out kind of as a a commoner, you know, and, and kind of Ray, he, he, yeah, he's he pulled a, he's himself a, up by his bootstraps. He's a landless noble. So yes, he has the title of a noble, but he doesn't have the lands of a noble. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and he, he thinks that Bartuk's problem was that, uh, Bartuk, while he was a warlord and everything like that, Bartuk was not a soldier. He was or not a, a soldier. He, he was, was a, a sorcerer. He was a sorcerer that fell into the warlording by way of magic, not by the right. way of knowing how to run an army. Right. It's a very <laughs> it's a very right wing America hating college professors and theory kind of thing. Pretty much. It's like theory versus action. He's like his problem is he spent too much time thinking about it and studying shit. And I want to get out there and get my fuck so, on. So Malevolent's real goal then is once he gets the armor of Bartuk is to resurrect Iraq, yeah uh i was gonna say so, oh right uh resurrect jfk jr <laughs> right i mean that's yeah that's clearly. the end game here yeah it's it's obvious <laughs> all signs point to yes <laughs> it's just, we both <laughs> oh our political humor knows no bounds my friend uh -huh. we've even for, we've even squeezed it right into diablo i mean it's right. Right in you'll, there. You'll, it's you'll never, never escape. You'll, you'll never, never escape. escape. It. You'll never. Um, but I think one of the interesting things is is Malevolent has is thinking all these thoughts and you're like, yes, these are all my own thoughts. And then we yeah. cut to the next scene and Zazak's like, ha, they're my thoughts. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Zazak's clearly whispering these ideas into Malevolent's head. <laughs> He's doing what demons do, and he's he's planting thoughts in Malevolent's head. Yeah. And one of the things I love is we get a little backstory into the politics of hell. Yes, I made a little graph. <laughs> you made a graph. I made a little. It's not, not much of one. I'll show everyone on Twitter uh, before the episode comes out. But I did the Infernal Civil War. Yep. So we get we get the we get it figured out. So Diablo, it's it's basically it's Asmodan and Belial or Belial's how they say it in the audiobook. Um, but Asmodan, uh, which is kind of a, a take on Asmodeus, I kind of love Diablo because it's not Christianity does not appear to exist. Right. But old school, dark it's, ages, demons and it's, angels it's totally do. Very. It, yeah. It uses Old Testament names. Very much so. Yeah. So we've got Asmodan and Belial uh, or Belial fighting against uh, fighting against the other side of hell. Uh, and which is the, Diablo. The Diablo. 
who wants Mi- to free his brothers Bale ba- and Bale Mephisto. and Mephisto. Yeah. So we yeah, that's that's the we get and and Zazek serves Belial. So as Medan and Belial have been are fighting each other. Bale I think and they're Mif- fighting. I thought they were fighting. With no. Him. So Bale and Mephisto are imprisoned. Yes. As Medan and Belial are fighting each other, and Diablo, they fear, would. Uh, so because they say, Zazax's lord, Belial, would reward his humble servant for such a find. Not only had the civil war in hell against Asmodan not gone well of late, um, but troublesome yeah. rumors had reached the, there that the primeval Diablo had made good his escape, and if so, he would free his brothers Bale and Mephisto. I so see. so it's like a it's like a it's like a hell triangle, right? You got Asmodan. It's gonna be it's gonna be a hell angle. Yeah, a hell angle. You got Asmodan versus Belial um versus uh Diablo, Mephisto, and Bale. So it's more like that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check out our Twitter account. Check out our Twitter and we'll... to, to see my my beautiful illustration. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Zazax works for Belial. Yes. Belial's his boss. And um, okay, yeah, yep. And as and currently they are on the losing side. Asmodan is the one who is currently winning the war, the civil war in hell. It seems. Yes, um, so far. And and whatever Zazax is doing with Bartok's armor is kind of like a, um, seems to be a seems to be a hail mary. Uh, <laughs> it, it really is. It's like it's like one last big chance. Big you know? move. Yeah. Uh, like if we could get control of this, it might uh, tilt the 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 civil war in favor of us. Right. Right. So he's he's kind of contemplating all of this. When uh, 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 Galeona shows up and demands to know what the hell he's doing. Yeah. He's like, uh, you're not supposed to be out and about, you, you dingus. Right. <laughs> so what are you doing? And he and he just he lies and says, I've been studying the helmet. I'm just checking out the Bartuk's helmet. Uh, and that's fine. You know, that's and, fine. And, and she's like, oh, OK. Yeah. And she, yeah she leaves it. <laughs> and then we get our. We get our first mention of angels in this, which I thought was great. The way that demons see angels. Uh, Let's see. He says uh, the demon respected her abilities in this matter, even if he felt confident that in a struggle between Galeona and himself, the witch woman would surely lose. After all, she was mortal, not one of the foul angels. Had she been such, Zazek might have been more concerned. Angels were conniving, working behind the scenes, playing tricks instead of confronting their foes directly me thinks that's foreshadowing i think so <laughs> so and we get this great moment at the end of the chapter where he literally zazek is thinking about angels and he out loud mocks the <laughs> idea of angels like, like fucking you fucking angels. angels come and get me angels i'm not afraid of you come angels. at me bro yeah and then the the light the torch like jumps just like you know how a light it flares do, yeah a flares up a bit and he like jumps for a the- second and becomes the mantis version of himself like he's out like, of fear ah. and, and he like re- he like retreats back into the shadows and he's like yeah he's like stupid fucking light stupid fucking <laughs> i wish the angels would fucking come i'll kick your ass i don't give a shit i don't care ah! i mean yeah you bet know, yeah you yeah it wasn't you was it pussy like yeah that's basically what happens i there. love the fact that I, I i love how much like he humanized Zazax, like yeah. after our first encounter with him, he's he's like, oh, he's like some creepy mantis demon. But then in this chapter, I love where where we leave with Zazax, where he's like, he's he is he's just a little paranoid. He's oh, he's and he's a toady, like he's, he's a, a toady. Total, he's like total. He's like fear I, baby toady. It's fantastic. <laughs> it, it's, he is he is not, uh, he's not the so, he's not the boss. He's a henchman. No, yeah, yeah the first time you see him. And the first time you see a demon, any demon's going to be scary. But then when you get to know him uh, a just chapter a later, he's just he's just he, yeah, he's a demon, but he's kind of a panty waste of a demon. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, So Norik, uh, we pick up chapter five. Norik is back on the road again. Yes. Um, after his fresh slaughter. at the yeah, Feeling feeling a little guilty about all the people that he helped kill. He's not feeling great. No. <laughs> He feels he's not. He's like, this really does this suck. Blows. Um, so they're like walking towards the uh, the ocean. And he's like, 
he's he, he's like it's the is the armor just going to make me walk through the ocean? Am I just going to drown or something? I loved that part. Like he's been, it's been, the armor is so single-minded yeah. that he's worried the armor is just going to go, oh, the easiest way is just to march through the sea. Just just keep walking. And just forget about him. And he's like, I, that would suck. That would Please be terrible. remember that. But that doesn't happen. Thankfully no, it him. seems, it seems more and more that the armor needs a living host. Yes, it cannot be it, like he has to be alive it, because otherwise, otherwise it would have let him die a lot earlier. Um, right. it, it's clear that he has to be alive and and like functioning in order for the armor to actually uh, use him. So, yeah, yeah, because so the armor do does not crazy. Like yeah, that. it doesn't do anything crazy like that. He runs into a uh, a fisherman and the he's uh, basically the armor like is like stops and he has to figure out what the armor wants right so he's talking to this fisherman and basically through uh a a, a q a a, he clicks through a dialogue tree (laughs) i was about to say it's kind of like you when you think about it he's kind of like on in an adventure game i was about to say yeah He's got, every time you stop for something, you've got to figure out what it is that the armor wants. So every stop is like a dialogue tree or a puzzle or something like that. Yeah, uh, he finds out that the uh, what the armor wants is to go to uh, Loot Golane, which happens to be where uh, uh, where what's his name? Malevolent. Is. Malevolent, yeah. He's amassing his army not far from. Um, so the armor wants to go to Loot Golane. And basically the guy, the fisherman's like, well, there's three ships. One is going back west. Uh, my uh, there's my ships going to Luke Lane, but we're not leaving until next week. And then this other shitty ship is is going to Luke Lane like today. Yeah, and he's like, stay off of that one. Don't that go one on it. Sucks. <laughs> That's terrible. And he wasn't lying. It's terrible. It um, really I actually grabbed. A, I thought this was a pretty good description of our of our pretty boats. Uh, this is called the it's called the Hawks Fire. And uh, it says the three masts stood like tall skeletal sentinels, half wrapped in the shroud like sails. The figurehead at bow, once probably a curvaceous mermaid, had been worn down by the elements until it now resembled more an aquatic banshee in mid shriek. As for the hull itself, something had long ago stained the wood nearly to pitch and scars raked the sides, making Norick wonder if it at some point in its colored past the vessel had either served in war or more likely had been used more than once as a freebooter. So he's about to board the Millennium Falcon. Basically. Uh, fucking hunk of junk. You know? It is a hunk <laughs> of junk. His bucket of bolts. Is, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> not going to even get out of the system. Um, so basically, <laughs> he's talking to the, the captain who... Um, this he uh, He's a rather haggard figure... And uh, this is a great description as well. What do you want? The skeleton coalesced into an older man with parchment skin and absolutely <laughs> no flesh and sinew but beneath the thin veil of life. This guy's a good writer. You know, like, like if there's one thing that Richard Neck seems to know how to do, it's, it's, it's set a things. scene. Yeah, yeah, set a scene. It's like, it's like, it was like, oh, it's not a skeleton. It's a really old man who might it's as just well be <laughs> a real old dirt bag of a man. And he is he's he's the captain of the ship, Captain Casco, Captain and, Casco. And he speaks in in sentence fragments. Right. <laughs> and he tells him and, and, and the guy and the guy's like, shit, OK, the armor wants we got to ride this boat. And so and this is I found really interesting because so far we've seen the armor summon things out of nowhere. Um, and in this time he says, you know, what, what would it cost for me to board? And the captain asks for a specific kind of coin. Yeah. He doesn't say gold. He doesn't say, you know, he just, he's it's a like specific, a, it's a very specific currency. Right. And before Nora can even figure out, well, how much is that in real person dollars? I don't know. Uh, the armor just pulls out a handful of those very coins. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of, yeah, it's, it gets, it's starting to get real specific yeah. uh, on this shit. Yeah. Uh, so he gets in, uh, he's got a, they give him a room uh, and he, he, it's a, it's a, it's a shithole. It's a shithole. And, it's, he, he, and he gets some sleep and once again, dreams of that. Being he is Bartok. Bartok. Yeah. 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 And, and then the uh, dinner bell rings. 
Ugh, thank thank God, right? I'm sure this place serves some some stand up cuisine. <laughs> It's, um, it's it doesn't. Uh, he goes, it he gets not. he gets the food. He's going to take it back to his room. And then uh, Norik sees Faustin standing yes. on, the, on the deck of the ship. And he's so startled, he drops the food. And Casco is like, what mess? You clean it up. No help. Yeah. Like, he's, you're, he's, you're like, you're not getting any more food. <laughs> it does sound like a Star Wars alien, like yeah. translator. No clean. You clean. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Houdini. Like it's just, Houdini. It's, yeah, it's, it's weird. So Captain he, Casco, he, the Jawa. Um, right. Right. And, uh, and, and so Norik kind of gathers himself and, and basically starts worrying that not only is it that this doesn't end well for him in terms of him living or dying, He's also concerned now. He's like, I don't think I'm I think I'm losing my soul here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it gets really dark. there. So. It gets really dark. And we're back with Kara. Kara. Uh, thank goodness. Kara. Thank good. Goodness. Kara a, Night Shadow. Gaya cool. Uh, yeah. A port town. Yeah. She's she's trying to figure things out. She's uh, she's looking for everything. She's looking for everything. She and she arrives at an inn called the captain's table. Which is, yes. which is a jaunty little joint, and uh, absolutely, she meets a cheerful man, um, just Captain Hanos Jeronin, who is the owner and proprietor of this establishment, and uh, yeah. he's he's flirting with her a little he's bit. A he's, flirty he's, he's a flirty old man. He's a flirty old man, and Kara's like, "Oh my!" <laughs> yeah, we do get we do get some very dated. Uh, you don't know how beautiful you are kind of description here. Yeah. Uh, where like, cause he, he's, he's not like trying to get in there. He's just, he's just, you know, flirting a little bit and yeah. saying that she's beautiful. Fair is what he says. And, uh, and we do get a, like, she never thought of herself that way. I suppose. Not like the other some, girls. Right. Yeah. At, at wizarding school, some people found me attractive, I suppose. And it, yeah, you do feel like it was a screenplay. It would be a hot, but doesn't know it. Kind yeah, of it's like, eh. <laughs> yeah, but we, we get over that pretty quick. Uh, yeah. Thankfully, I, I, we didn't we didn't we don't dwell on that. No, we don't um, dwell on it too, too much. Um, basically, the captain, uh, uh, she she buys she buys uh, some cider. She gets some cider, mm -hmm. a fish, uh, a nice uh, fish meal. And the captain's like, yeah, I'll, I'll answer whatever questions you got. Just eat up. Um, right. and, 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 he, and he even offers her free food and free room. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, because he knows what she is. He knows that she's a necromancer. He knows he's like, he's like, yeah, I'm, I've, I've been a fan of the, the Rathma people for a long time. You know, they've yeah. always, it's like, they've always been nice to me, basically. It's, right. It's, right. It's he, he, always, he said, you know, of all the people, <laughs> all, all the people that we, all wizards I've ever met, you people are always the nice ones. So. Yeah. Which I believe, I think, I think if your day to day business involves death, you're probably going to be pretty nice. To yeah, you're going to be pretty nice. Um, it's like, oh god. <laughs> so she yeah. asks him, you know, some some questions like, "Hey, have you seen anybody with uh, a crimson plate?" And Dronin's like, "Um, no, I don't think no. so." He's, yeah, he's very wishy washy. He is it. very wishy washy. Um, and then Kara, um. Kara notices that she is sleepy and not oh yeah and not tired sleepy but no. sleepy sleepy and now she's like oh no yes yeah, something may have happened to my cider something I is... wonder if it was the inappropriately flirty guy who I wonder if it was the drink. inappropriately flirty old man yeah. Uh, <laughs> so she heads out because we she actually a don't pleasure. get a we don't get a full answer on that but she no, does we don't we don't uh, we don't know if it was him specifically she yeah, heads out yet. because fresh air is going to help and she like she heads out breathes in the the salty fresh air and it does help it clears her head for a moment yeah before she's whacked upside the head by right. somebody <laughs> right she sees she sees a, a figure carrying her knife she sees the wizard and uh, the Sardoon character, both of our dead uh, adventuring party friends, who are kind of corpsified. They're not like full zombies, but they're still bearing the wounds uh, that yeah. killed them. Yep, dead but moving around. Yeah. So we find out that it was it was um, it was Faustin had cast a spell on her to to knock her out. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, they they knock her out. They have her dagger. And um, she's uh, they basically hit her on the head 
And it's, you know, that scene in, in Back to the Future Part 2 where... The he, easy the way. The easy way. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what happens. That's basically what happens. <laughs> the easy way. What a weird scene in a movie, by the way. You want to do oh, this the hard not. way or the easy way? <laughs> the easy way. Such so, a great moment. Though. It is. It's so random. <laughs> Well, that's chapter five. That's chapter five, and that's where we're going to leave it for tonight. So what are you feeling so far? Man, there are so many threads. So it's like there's so many threads. You that's know? exactly what it is. We are we are setting up so many threads here. It's a little slow uh, to start with, but I I am optimistic. I feel, yeah, like, I feel like we're going somewhere with this. I think I, I have faith. You know, I wasn't sure, but talking through it um talking through it just now i have faith that it's probably all going to tie together in 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 some nice way you know in effective way it's yeah. gonna it's gonna like a little it's it's basically like a it's like making a rope you know all the threads yeah. are currently loose so like oh we got all these threads and now we're gonna start tying them together right right and so it's it's pretty cool so far it's pretty uh, cool and it's fun that like characters like, for example, uh, uh, Faustian and say say Dune, who I just kind of thought were like throw in, you know, party members to be killed in the beginning, yeah, to set things up. But they're back, they're back. Like everybody that they've introduced so far, except for the Sand Snake, has kind of come back <laughs> and, and and had significance. Yeah. And maybe and maybe the sand snake will come back. I don't know. Yeah. But uh we've Old. had a lot of little seeds planted. We've got weird desert dwelling hermit guy. Uh yeah, we've who's got this, that guy. I, I can't believe that the camp the captain innkeeper that this is the last we'll see of him. The, yeah. Like that's if if this is it, if that is it, then he spent a lot of time describing this His guy extravagant who belly. His, yeah, yeah. I I wanna I want uh, I think I think we've got a lot of uh, cool yeah uh, cool shit going here so fingers crossed but yeah I, I I'm optimistic I feel good about this I feel good about it too frankly it's just good to uh, be doing a little little sword swinging yeah a little Robert E Howard for us yeah why not I mean the, the dude wrote Conan before he's he's written hell yeah he's written yeah. a Conan book so you know oh um, my god I can't tell you if I if I were a writer for hire and someone told like, me hey, you want to write some conan commission you to write conan <laughs> i'd lose my shit I'd be, I'd, I'd be like trying real i'd be like well that sounds like um it would be very difficult uh but you know i'm i'm i think i'm up for I the think challenge I can do i'm it. a great admirer of this franchise thank you so much i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm just gonna excuse me one second and i think i've put them on mute and i start screaming and like <laughs> Also, for some reason, farting and puking everywhere. Oh, and uh, that sounds and about I right. realize I haven't muted them. And they're like, we we uh, actually changed our mind. We're going to give going the assignment in. to this Kevin guy. We're, uh, <laughs> we're going in another direction. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're going in a non a non vomiting when you're excited direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, that, I, that, that makes sense. Yeah, makes makes sense. Sense. Yeah. Good call. Good, good call. call. Good call. Good call. I, I, I buy it. Um, oh, um I'll, I'll just continue on my Leisure Suit Larry fan fiction. <laughs> uh, are you working on one? <laughs> now I am. <laughs> now, that I, now that I've put that now out that you in the put world. that out in the universe, please. I mean, I don't know who owns Leisure Suit Larry right now. Um, I, I don't think it's Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe. <laughs> Rob Lowe? Rob Lowe? Rob Lowe? Um, what? I, oh, my God. I'm an asshole. Uh, I interviewed the fucking guy. Are you talking about the uh uh, uh Allo? Oh, Allo. Okay. Allo. I'm an idiot. Uh, I've, I've actually I've actually spoken to him. You've spoken my, to with, him. Yeah, with my mouth. With your mouth uh, and the words. We, we we chatted for like an hour and a half. He was a super nice guy, and I'm an asshole for not remembering him. Well, there you but go. I'm I'm I'll 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 reach out and be like, hey, Al, what do you think? You know who I owns this fan fiction? <laughs> Yeah, I at the time I was actually considering writing like a history of Leisure Suit Larry book. Like I was just playing with the idea, and uh, we got to talking, and he was like, "You want to write a book?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, "Who do you think's gonna read it about Leisure <laughs> Suit Larry?" Yeah, and when a, and when a cr when the creator of of the franchise is like, "I don't know if anyone's gonna read that." He's doing the yeah, he's doing like the cutoff motion with his <laughs> hand, like. Ugh. 
some things are better left in the 80s is yeah yeah <laughs> is yeah. basically what he said <laughs> and more and more harebrained schemes from me so yeah <laughs> Um, anyway, so thanks everybody for listening. We've had, uh, this episode is going to be coming out in March, uh, but Mm -hmm. we're just coming off a spectacular February, uh, of, of growth and and new people coming to the pod. It's It's been been so cool to see all you guys. It's been so cool. Um, and we're also coming off a couple of episodes, uh, with our good friend, Aaron Hess from Oops All Monsters. So if you're new to the podcast, uh, please go listen to those episodes and please go check out Oops All Monsters because they are hilarious. Hilarious. Um, so that'll do it for tonight. Please, if you can, rate us five stars on the platform of your choice, whether that be iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Um, those are the rating platforms, I believe. And, you know, just get click. make sure you click that follow and subscribe button. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, share us with your friends share us with your family share us with everyone you love and cherish deeply because we are the gift that keeps on giving we give we give we give and take nothing we We take take nothing nothing. Nothing. uh uh, pixel it makes the world takes as the that is a very specific reference to a bridge in trenton that has trenton makes the world takes in big letters on the side of it and i don't that's for like five people. You dug deep for that. Oh, that is was, a, I'm impressed. That is a deep cut. Trenton makes the world one. takes. Pixel it yeah. makes the world takes. <laughs> we don't. Pixel it does not take. We just passive aggressively make comments under our breath at Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's and as you do, and you should. As you should. And uh, proud tradition. Proud tradition. That'll do it. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.